So let's begin this discussion with the fact. I have no idea whatsoever what my art is about. <laughs> Nor do I feel it's even my business to know or care about what it's about. In fact, knowing might just might prevent me or distract me from doing it if I really understood what it was about. However, I do strongly consider my life's task to be making art. It is my reason for getting up. It is also sometimes my reason for not wanting to get up at all. Mm -hmm. I find that cavernous space between my ears, where these ideas come from, to be a mystery to me too. Equally mysterious is why I have these thoughts. Why can't I like baseball or fishing or poker or <laughs> figure skating or collecting shoes or collecting small groundhogs? <laughs> Wonderfully for me, I don't feel any compulsion to contain, examine, or judge these thoughts once they come about. It seems to me it's my responsibility to utilize or organize them into their completeness. And then, and only then, do I sign them or destroy them, for I am attempting to do the best I can at the moment. <coughs> Picasso once said every piece that he did was one towards the possibility that one might be decent. Possibility and decent are the two words that I have been captivated with. I start all of when I taught, I started those, that saying as the beginning thing because it gives us a great deal of opportunity and hope instead of I am going to be great. All of my pieces, are my pieces violent, peculiar, humorous? Are they exaggerated, odd, ridiculous? Are they lies or truths? The answer of course is uh, Yes, uh, no, uh, maybe, possibly. <coughs> However, the question is generally a question decided by a critic or an art historian, or my apologies, or who is also possibly using their judgment to further their own careers. That's not an unusual situation in places like New York. It's sometimes decided by the right time and the right place. It's even sometimes decided on talent, if you can imagine that. It's sometimes decided as a financial question by a collector, a gallery, or a museum. I've been involved in the large dollar bracket of my sales expanded and my galleries got larger and frequently they took 60 to 70 percent of my take. It made it almost impossible to recoup what I had put into it because of that reality, but that's part of how the process of growing happens. My prices got higher and higher. They made it more and more unlikely that the normal middle class person like you and I could even afford it. I'm not sure I would buy it myself. So, <clears throat> six years ago I decided that I would re replace all of the prices on my things to $450 for most of my pieces. And some are higher, but generally that. I can sell it now to more people. I can sell it now to the people that supported me when there was no reason to support me. Allowing me to, lowering my prices, <coughs> allowed me to reconnect with the very people that made a difference in my career. But for now, it's just wonderful to be able to share my work at a price that's reasonable to more people. Artists don't generally make a living on their art. That's a fantasy. In general, it's a fantasy. Most of us work in some other capacity. All in all, I'm fortunate. I'll never achieve that claim of greatness. This is not a self-deprecating statement. Uh, my ego, as you've noticed, is well intact. It's doing well. Uh, but I think ego is essential to all creative people to survive and make more of their art, in my opinion. This is a fact. I don't have the talent for greatness. I was going to be Rembrandt, no doubt in my mind. I think most of us have to have that name in our mind, or Henry Moore. However, I don't have the talent, and that is not a put-down of myself. I'm quite blessed. 
I'm a creative person who has been granted the right to drive and, and the need and the demand to create constantly. My day is not complete if I'm not creating. And the days I'm not creating, I have a difficult time with mental health. My mind in that, at this time is my life. It's filled with ideas. It's ravenous to create, to discover, to invent, to suggest, and to lie. I'm able to start over and re-explore when my curious mind demands it, and I seem sometimes even tell the truth. My biased, contaminated eyes, my talented, tainted vision, my delightful, creative, and colorful vision, my bizarre, tormented viewpoint is all mine. So what is wrong with my mind? You've seen my work. <laughs> You may be astonished to hear me tell you nothing is wrong with my mind. Nothing is wrong with my mind at all. Perhaps, though, the only thing that distinguishes it is that it's mine, not yours. It's subject to what I've assimilated or witnessed in art, nature, literature, music, human interactions, observations, and failures. It's subject, then, to how my creative mind views this information. How my mind interprets, distinguishes, and examines this information. It's subject to what I understand of the great masters of humor, the ancient arts, color, animals, native artists. All of these factors determine for me the moment of creation, my view of my art. Wow, it's, it's really refreshing to be able to freely experience express myself through my art. It's very consistent as I look at strange things in strange ways and personal ways. And, I, and, I, and because I do, I sometimes, I'm not taken seriously. I'm not considered a real artist uh, or a realist artist. Now I ask you, do I look like a real artist? I've been around for 77 years. I now ask you to look and see the mystery, the disguise, the absent, the presence of information, the curious and the absurd. I ask you to discover that there is a language and a form to my art. There is color theory. There is composition. All of those things were embedded in me as a student at the Art Institute of Chicago. Almost all of those were subjects that I, at one time or another, said, I'm not going to take that shit, I'm going to be a real artist. <laughs> and if those teachers are still alive, they should be laughing in their socks and using me as an example. Thank God those things stuck. My own quirky personal views of how all of this might look, should look, does look, are mine alone. These are my compositions made from all I assimilate, borrow, and copy of the world. This is what a creative person does, no matter what form of creativity it is. We borrow, we assimilate, we take, we add, and we subtract. I have no qualms about the invitation, but I know some of you will reject it to look at my work. I feel pain over this. Of course, if that's the case, if you find nothing in my work, what's it to me? I'm still compelled to make it. I still will make it. Should you feel that you know something about my art, what my art means or says, I'm so sorry for you, I, I certainly am not. Should you consider them, if they resonate in you in some way, then buy them. Hell yes. They'll make you happy. They'll make you thinner. They'll make you more pleasant and better looking. Should you laugh openly at the titles of my works or the images? Why not? They're happy. The titles, in most cases, are random applications of my interesting thoughts. The titles in most cases of my work are to entertain me because one of my most 
difficult times is being with you when you come to my opening. And I want to say, I love your socks. Next. Because <laughs> I don't know what to say. So when I make up titles and it says three kangaroos in a blue bus, and you say, I see it. <laughs> and I'm going, no, you don't. <laughs> Or in Chicago, I remember very clearly doing a show, uh, because in Chicago it's a different kind of opening. It's a new coat and very dressy kind of deal. And champagne, not regular old wine. And I did a series of toys that were on a 12-inch rope. And they were about 12 inches tall. And all of the people had to try them out. <laughs> would do this. And I was entertained. <laughs> Funny that I'm entertained by a bunch of butts on the but anyway. <laughs> My titles are just a great use of thoughts that I used to think were great jokes in a classroom, and the general receiving of them in the classroom would be called on. <laughs> and so they became a way for me to categorize my work for Uncle Sam, who wants to know where everything is, etc. If you choose to reject my work, at least consider it and think about it before you do that, because all of us do work. I don't think there's anything required when you come in a gallery to feel like you have to like what's there, but I think you should, if you're bothering to come to a gallery, to think about what you see, because most of us think of these things and we bring them back at another time to review. Most of us, as creative people, will see something, put it away either in a sketchbook or in these incredibly interesting files we have up here, and come back to it and review it. Most of us are identifiable as artists because we investigate the same things over and over and over. Be that a poet, be that a painter, a ballet dancer, there is something that identifies it. You know Copeland when you hear Copeland as opposed to Tchaikovsky. You know Rembrandt as opposed to Van Gogh because we explore the same small ideas, but they're large ideas to us. Yeah, I, I often wish I was given the talents of Van Gogh or Rembrandt or Henry Moore or closer to home artists like Barney Bright or Ed Hamilton or Meg White or John McNaughton or Mike McCarthy or Don Lawler, but I wasn't. But then I have my own problems. My problem is a simple one, and it's my fate and it's my question. Will I live long enough to do one decent piece? One thing for sure, I intend to keep practicing because that is what I believe my manifestation of creativity is to practice and practice and practice in the hope, and it won't be in my life, but that <coughs> somebody will say, you know, he did one decent piece. I hope I have maybe 30 more years. That'll make me 107. I would humbly express my gratitude for years of faith and support from the Kentucky folks and the United States folks who have been ever so supportive of my work. Thank you.